We'll go ahead and get started here. Um, welcome to all of you to uh, University of Alaska Southeast and to our evening at Egan session this evening, which is focusing on collaborative research in Southeast Alaska. I'm Rick Caulfield. I'm provost here at UAS, and it, it's great to see a uh, uh, really nice turnout here. Uh, it's, it felt like a, a fall day today, uh, a little bit of rain, a little bit of snow, and it uh, seemed like a real change of season. So it seems like a good night to be inside and learning about uh, exciting projects, collaborative research here in Southeast. And we've got a, a really talented panel here uh, who are going to be talking about some of the projects associated with our collaborations through the Alaska Coastal Rainforest Center and other projects associated with UAS. And I don't need to tell anyone here in this audience about what an exceptional environment we get to live here, live in here in uh, southeast Alaska between glaciers and ice fields, the marine environment, uh, the richness of our languages and the cultures, the richness of the economic livelihood that we benefit from in our natural environment here through fisheries and so forth. Uh, it really is a terrific place to live. It's also a terrific place to do research. And we're blessed in this community to have a lot of really talented scientists who work uh, in this environment. And the university, uh, tries to be a facilitator to bring the talents of our scientists across the different agencies, the different uh, public and private sector, uh, focusing on projects that are important to our livelihoods here in Southeast Alaska. At UAS, research is an integral part of our mission. We have our mission statement right here, and research and creative activities is one of our four core themes. So this is a great opportunity tonight to put a spotlight on some of those collaborative research possibilities. And to do that, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Allison Bidlack, who is our director for the Alaska Coastal Rainforest Center. ACRC, as she'll tell you, is a university-based partnership for research and education in coastal temperate rainforests, extending all the way from Kodiak down through Prince William Sound, southeast Alaska, down into British Columbia, and all the way down into Puget Sound. So it's a very extensive area, including Southeast Alaska, but by no means limited to that. Alaska Coastal Rainforest Center was started in 2009, and uh, Mike Goldstein from the U.S. Forest Service was assigned to help us get the center up and running. He went back to his day job with the Forest Service, and just this past summer, we were really fortunate to hire uh, Allison, uh, and she started as director in, two uh, in uh, August of this year, 2012. She came to us um, having done her PhD work at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, she did her master's degree at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, so she knows Alaska well. Uh, she had to make the, the move down to the banana belt here from Cordova, uh, and it took her a while to get her truck from Cordova to a road system where she could, because of the weather and because of the ferries and whatnot, but we're truly fortunate to have her here. Her background is in uh, wildlife ecology with an emphasis in population genetics, uh, habitat modeling using geographic information systems. And she's done work on uh, flying squirrels on Prince of Wales Island. And she's looked at the distribution and habitat use of carnivores in the San Francisco Bay Area. And more recently, she's been involved with creating habitat models for Chinook salmon on the Copper River watershed. And when she applied for this job and actually came here to UAS to describe some of her experiences and her uh, academic background, uh, she talked about the work that she's done with Ecotrust in Cordova, bringing together uh, stakeholders concerned about the Copper River, River watershed um, and state and federal agencies, the tribes in that region, just a whole host of um, stakeholders. And uh, that's exactly what we've asked her to do here in Southeast Alaska with the Alaska Coastal Rainforest Center. So with that, um, I'm going to introduce um, Allison, and she will then, in turn, introduce our panelists who are here to share some exciting news about various collaborative research projects. And I was reminded before um, I do that, I'm supposed to tell you about next week's Evening in Egan, which is at the same time in the same location. We have uh, David Tallman, our Associate Professor of Biology here at UAS, who's going to be talking about um, what can the shifty fishes of Auk Creek tell us about adaptation to warming streams in southeast Alaska. And David and some of his students are going to be talking about collaborative research again uh, involving NOAA, uh, UAS, the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and students of David's who are working on um, 
sculpin and salmon populations and the population dynamics in uh, Auk Creek and Auk Lake. So with that, I hope you can join us next week. But for now, I'll go ahead and turn it over to, to Dr. Allison Bidlack. Thanks, Rick, and uh, thank you all for coming tonight. I appreciate you spending your evening, your Friday evening here with us. As Rick mentioned, I am the director of the Alaska Coastal Rainforest Center. I'm also faculty here in the Arts and Sciences at UAS. The Coastal Rainforest Center is a university-based partnership for research and education in the coastal temperate rainforest. Uh, our, meeting, our, our mission is to develop and deliver educational opportunities, to conduct research, and to promote learning for the community about uh, coastal temperate rainforests. We were started in 2009, as Rick mentioned. There were researchers and managers from six organizations, the University of Alaska Southeast, the University of Alaska Fairbanks, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the U.S. Forest Service, Alaska Region, and U.S. Forest Service um, Pacific Northwest Research Station, as well as the city and borough of Juneau. Those researchers and, and managers got together and they thought, you know what, what we really need is an organization that can coordinate research, that can cooperatively manage data, that can raise awareness and educate the public about the temperate rainforest. They felt that a lot of uh, good work was being done, but it wasn't being done in a cooperative manner. So they envisioned ACRC as a nucleus for ecological, economic, and social research in the North Pacific rainforest region. It was never meant to be um, Tongass or even Alaskan-based. It was meant to cover the whole region from Kodiak down to Puget Sound. Since 2009, uh, 12 other partners have joined uh, us. Other federal agencies, uh, the University of Alaska Anchorage joined. We have nonprofits uh, such as the Nature Conservancy and the Juno Economic Development Council. We also have small science centers, regional science centers such as the Prince William Sound Science Center and the Sitka Sound Science Center. And then also most significantly we have entities from British Columbia. So we span the geographic range from Prince William Sound in the north to the Geos Institute in Seattle in the south. Um, and then also uh, we span in across institutional barriers and um, national barriers as well. Again, as, Rich, uh, as Rick mentioned, the coastal temperate rainforest does extend from Kodiak Island and Cook Inlet in the north all the way down to actually the redwood forests of Sonoma County, just north of, of San Francisco, an area that I'm pretty familiar with. Um, we live in the per-humid rainforest, which per-humid means always wet. Um, <laughs> imagine that. Uh, we're very, very lucky here in Alaska and, and somewhat in British Columbia that most of our original rainforest is still um, extant. Um, you can see the red down in, in Washington and Oregon. Much of the rainforest has been logged or developed down there. As you know who live here, this is an incredibly rich and complex ecosystem. Uh, we have rivers that transport nutrients and glacial water from, from mountains down into the Gulf of Alaska. We have salmon that bring many of those nutrients back up to the terrestrial system. We have very interesting and disjunct distributions of plants and animals here, uh, as well as many endemics, uh, such as the Prince of, Wales, Prince of Wales flying squirrel, which I studied for my master's. Uh, we have uh, rich cultural traditions, uh, native languages and cultures. Um, we also have a very robust natural resources economy, particularly with fishing and tourism here. So the goals of the ACRC are, are threefold. One is to provide educational and professional training opportunities related to the temperate rainforest for all ages. That's, and when I'm talking, talking about all ages, I mean K through 12, I mean undergraduate and graduate students, I mean working professionals and uh, citizens as well. Second is to conduct and facilitate coastal temperate rainforest research in the biological, physical, and social sciences. So again, this isn't just an ecology group. And then third is to integrate community interests in conservation, management, resource utilization, and public policy. So we're trying to find, we're trying to understand the system that we live and work in a little bit better so that we can manage, manage this uh, complex social ecological system. So real quickly, some of the things that we've done uh, in the past, over the past several years, and, and these were efforts that uh, the previous director, Mike Goldstein, led. Uh, we've been involved with uh, several cross-boundary data integration workshops. These were in conjunction with the Southeast Alaska GIS Library and the North Pacific Landscape Conservation Cooperative, which is a federal uh, initiative. 
These were to bring, these workshops were to bring uh, researchers and managers from the US and Canada together. As you know, water and wildlife and money and language travel over borders quite easily. Data doesn't, <laughs> for whatever reason. So um, this was to, to help that along a little bit. We've also co-sponsored uh, the Southeast Alaska BioBlitz events. Um, these are really fun, single-day biodiversity events. Get people out there. Um, they're great for kids to see kind of, well, kids and adults, to see you know, what lives in their area. Um, they're also really great for managers and scientists. <laughs> OK. Um, I keep hearing feedback. So. They're also really great for managers and scientists. They can document species distributions of native species or invasives. Last spring, we also hosted the Coastal Rainforest Center Symposium. This was held in Centennial Hall uh, here in Juneau. We had over 350 attendees, and they came to hear talks ranging from forest and stream ecology to natural resource economics to traditional ecological knowledge. Um, it was very well attended and well received. So looking ahead, what are the things that I'm going to be working on? Um, just real briefly, we're working with the Forest Service to develop some continuing education workshops for pro professionals here in the rainforest region. Uh, the first one we're thinking about putting on potentially this summer is a uh, genetics, uh, laboratory genetics methods workshop for um, wildlife and fish uh, researchers and managers. I'm also working on um, some National Science, Science Foundation funding efforts. Uh, the first will be to um, uh, get funding for some data collection uh, and infrastructure at Hinlatini Experimental Forest. And Rick Edwards, our second speaker tonight, is going to be talking a little bit more about that. We're also working on a co-management agreement uh, among the Forest Service, uh, UAS, and Central Council. I'm also then working on a marine terrestrial complex systems research program that will involve many of the partners of the ACRC. That's another NSF funded proposal. And then third, I'm, I'm, I've been starting to talk with Sitka Sound Science Center, Prince William Sound Science Center, and the Hakai Institute about designing and developing an environmental observation network that would include both professional and citizen scientists in collecting uh, climate and other types of data um, so that we can span that sort of geographic range of the rainforest. Um, so looking at broad spatial and temporal scales, looking at changes, uh, uh, global climate change or, or changes brought about by, by human development. And this is my last slide, just so you know some of the events and workshops that we're working on. Coming up next month is GeoFest Juno. So the second week in November is National Geography Awareness Week. And <laughs> the, the theme this year is Declare Your Interdependence. Uh, we helped out with this last year. Um, it's going to be down at the Mendenhall Glacier Visitor Center, and there's going to be lots of activities and such for kids. Um, and it was, a, it was a lot of fun last year, um, so I hope, again, this year we'll, we'll have a good time. Um, I believe last year Discovery Southeast was there, the Park Service, uh, Juno School District, uh, Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and UAS all had events. And then three other things that are coming up, we're working with um, the Alaska Climate Science Center, as well as the North Pacific Landscape Conservation Cooperative to put on a glacier science workshop here uh, in the winter. I've been in talks with Sea Alaska Corporation, as well as uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Fish and Game, and UAS to put on a salmon habitat and managed forest systems workshop. And then we're also going to be uh, taking part in, the, in one more cross-boundary data integration workshop in Vancouver uh, sometime this spring. So with that, I think I'll wrap up. And um, what I would like to do, I'm going to introduce our, the first speaker. Um, and uh, each of our three speakers is going to talk for about 15 minutes and tell you about some of the research that they've been involved with in Southeast Alaska. Um, I'd like to hold all questions until the end. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Jan Straley. She is an associate professor of marine biology at UA Southeast in Sitka. And she's going to be talking today about her collaborative work with fishermen and sperm whale predation. It's a bit of a stretch here to get over to the uh, podium or the uh, computer. You did a very graceful job. Oh, did I? Yes. You're, right. I'm not sure I can be there so you graceful. Go. <laughs> but, uh, all right. Well, thank you for coming tonight. I'm grateful for the provost's office to bring me over here from Sitka. And before I start about my research, I'd like to let everybody know about Sitka Whale Fest. It's coming up the first weekend in November, second 
third and fourth. And the theme fits perfectly with the, uh, tonight's topic because it is cold rivers to the sea, terrestrial connections to our northern oceans. Sitka Whale Fest is a nonprofit that started 16 years ago. It is no longer a nonprofit. It is now part of the Sitka Sound Science Center as a program as um, under the uh, the Sitka Sound Science Center nonprofit, and so it, we merged, and it's a, the, exactly the same program. It's just now under a different administration. So, and there are brochures over uh, on the piano. So tonight, I'm going to talk to you about a great research project that I got involved with. Uh, who uh, in early 2003, we actually started looking for funding in the late 1990s. Fishermen uh, came into my office, and because I was a marine mammal researcher, they thought I would know everything about all marine mammals, and they were having trouble with sperm whales in their longline fisheries. The sperm whales were taking fish off their gear, so they thought I could help them figure it out. Well, I didn't even know sperm whales really were in the North Pacific outside of Sitka at that time, because I'm a humpback whale researcher, and they're real coastal. So I did learn rapidly that sperm whales were offshore, and this is the story of uh, how I got involved in sperm whale research. And I should say, too, that working with industry, I'd never done it before, and it's really opened my eyes to the way science and research can be done and really be beneficial to, uh, to a whole realm of the world and the economy of the world that I had not a clue that existed. So it really was a, it's a wonderful avenue for me to really use my research in a, in a different way than I had been using it before. So this is a Southeast Alaska Sperm Whale Avoidance Project, or C-SWAP, and it's cooperative research between scientists, fishermen, and government. And you can see there's a huge list of collaborators that have worked with us over the years. It's, a, it's an amazing group of people. And this is a, just a collage of all the fishing boats and fishermen and the whales that are all part of the project. Right here are sable fish, that's the target fish that these longliners are after, and that's what they look like if the, if the um, whale didn't get it totally off the line. They shred, shredded bodies, uh, lips, and uh, um, uh, sometimes just the uh, head is left. And this is a sable fish, what it looks like in the hole. It's, um, they live to be a long time, and they can be up to three feet in length. And it's one of the most lucrative fisheries in Alaska. And this is this sperm whale. This is a culprit that's a, it's called depredation when a, when a marine mammal removes fish off a long line gear. And you can see this the small mouth right there, the teeth only on the lower jaw. It's a really interesting creature. It doesn't fit hardly any of the typical marine mammal boxes in terms of culture or, or um, how, they, how they live their lives. But these are uh, uh, an amazing animal that we have um, in our waters in the Gulf of Alaska. It was thought, and when I first started this project, I thought that they just ate squid, but actually when you read the whaling literature, it shows that the coastal whales, the whales that are near coastal, um, the coastline, including the Gulf of Alaska, historically, the whaling biologists did remove fish, including sable fish, from the stomach. So this is a, a typical um, prey item for sperm whales in the Gulf of Alaska. Depredation is now pretty common, and the reason why is because one whaling stopped on sperm whales in the 1980s, the last sperm whale was taken in the Pacific, and also the fishery changed and the management of the fishery changed and to really understand why it's happening now and it didn't happen, say, in the late 70s when it was primarily a Japanese fishery and then it became an American fishery and it was year round and then slowly it became a derby style fishery for just two weeks for a long time. And then with IFQs or individual fishing quotas, the fishery expanded to almost nine months and so it just gave sperm whales more opportunity to learn this behavior. As well as there's uh, more whales out there. So the goals and objectives of the first part of this project working with the fishing industry was to figure out how the total goal is to help fishermen reduce depredation from occurring on the long lines. And to do that, we needed to understand a lot of things about sperm whales. Were there five whales doing it? Were there 50 whales doing it? Were there 500 whales? Exactly what is the cue the whales are using to find the vessels? And this is our study area, and I'll play what the sperm whale sounds like.
Sometimes I'll say it. That clicking is a sperm whale, and that's what they do almost all their lives. Except for when they're on their surface, they often don't click, but that's how they communicate and hear what's going on in their world. And this is our study area off Sitka. And these are some of our vessels that are involved in the project, and they were our data collectors for the first part, and they still are for the, the project, but they really helped collect the initial data. They set, if you don't know about long line fishing, they set these long lines on the, on the bottom of the ocean. There's a hook spaced about a meter apart on things called ganyons, and uh, this is essentially what it looks like, and they have a vertical line that goes to the surface. And every fisherman does things differently, and so this is what's different about working with industry than doing a science project or a research project where you actually have an experiment, experimental design set out. Every fisherman sets their gear differently, and so it creates real challenges for data analysis. And that's how the fisher brought over the roller over the side of the boat. And one of the uh, aspects of this project is figuring out how many whales are out there, and you can identify whales, these whales like humpbacks, except they don't have a black and white pattern on their flukes by the shape of their fin and, and also their dorsal fin. And we found a lot of different things. I won't go into all the details, but we found f whales fishing offshore or feeding offshore when there were no fishing boats. So it's, there's a natural foraging habitat for them. There's a seasonal aspect to depredation. And the conflict really is, is spatially and temporally, the whales and the fishermen wanted to be in the same place looking for the same prey, basically. Fishermen are collecting, sa harvesting sable fish and whales were eating sable fish. And because they're so vocal and they echolocate to find their prey, acoustics was really going to be the way to look and understand this problem. And these are all the things that we decided we needed to look at at first. And really the key is what cue the whales were using. And the, fortunately, the, the, um, the bottom topography of the Gulf of Alaska off Sitka is, is very echo, or, reflective and so echoes reflect off that bottom so a sperm whale makes a sound and it bounces back and forth from the bottom to the surface of the ocean and with that little bit of knowledge you can figure out where that whale is in the in the water column by recording it on two hydrophones and calculating the distance and it's just a little simple geometry and so we use vertical arrays with re autonomous recorders on on a vertical line one of the vertical lines of the long line set in fact and fishermen are actually doing this work for us. And we, what we found out was that the propeller cavitation, or bubbles in the water, is what the whales were using to cue in. Bubbles are very loud underwater. And so the next step was to figure out how the whales are removing the fish off the long line. Well, we set a camera on the long line. And this is the camera. And there's a fish that we put back down on the, lo on the line. And, we couldn't simulate a true um, set because the camera couldn't go to the bottom and come up. So when we knew the fish, the whales don't like not, uh, snarls or rockfish, they would leave the rockfish, so we'd camouflage. We thought we'd trick the whale. <laughs> and this is what we found. That's a whale targeting the camera housing. It had air in it. So it has a hydrophone in the camera. And that's a sperm whale or a fish about six feet away from the camera looking up. See those lower jaw teeth? And you can see how gently he's grabbing that line. And watch as he moves up and creates tension on that line. And as soon as that one fish pops off, 
So then he goes, and we don't see him go actually get that fish, but we assume that he did. So that really opened our eyes. Before that time, we had been thinking empty hooks meant the bait just fell off. Well, we were wrong about that. So that made us think that there is another way to, uh, um, to develop a metric for understanding how many fish are being removed by sperm whales from the longline fleet. And NOAA has an interest in this because they have a longline survey where they, where they go out and calculate what biomass is out there to set a quota for the year. And so we're also working collaboratively with NOAA, with the Ocbe Lab, with Chris Lunsford and his group. They do surveys on these big vessels every year, and essentially what we're looking for is using the creek rate, those, cl those clicks, and then when the whale got really close, clicks get really close together, and then there's a pause after it, is what we're assuming is a successful prey capture. And so we are having this survey vessel last year put every st single set in the Gulf of Alaska, every station, they had autonomous recorders, and so we have an amazing data set of all the whales that were around their vessels, and we're calculating out how many, estimating the removal by using the creek rate on those sets. So the other aspect of this is to use those data along with the commercial fishermen's data that the commercial fishermen have been collecting for us as well to come up with avoidance measures and we're testing those this year and next year and some of those deterrent testing are putting things on the line that will perhaps deter the whale from wanting to uh, approach the line and we're, we are right now we are um, we haven't tested them this yet but we're going to use jammers and this is this is going to be um, quite an array. Jammers, beads, bubblers, and because a bubbler it goes on the line and one of our fishermen is developing this and it puts out a stream of bubbles because bubbles are can acoustically um, cloud or uh, shadow the line from the whales. The beads, we've calculated that there's a single acrylic bead that's about three quarters of an inch in diameter and that has the same target strength as a sable fish to a sperm whale. So but essentially we put one on every single ganyan and the, what the theory is is that it looks like there's a one whole line of, of um, sable fish or black cod on the line and the whale won't know, know where to start, start and stop because if you listen to that sperm whale video underwater, that whale was scanning the line looking for where the fish stopped and where it started. And then the, uh, the jammer is something that we haven't tested yet but the theory is is that it will go on the line spaced often enough that the sperm whale if it sends out an echolocation click, it will essentially, its signal will get jammed. And this is based on, on a study that, that somebody that studied bats, and bats eat moths, and moths have naturally developed a jamming feature so bats can't capture them. This is the bead right here in the lower corner right there. So, and then our last one is a decoy. So we're setting decoys out, vertical lines, because whales will hang out at vertical lines. We're also putting a speaker with a playback machine that simulates engine cycling to have that whale essentially be a decoy. It's not a real set, but it's a fake set. And we've done this just a little bit, and it's actually worked, and we're going to test it more in depth next spring. If anybody has any other ideas, just bring them on because we've heard them all. So, so. Essentially what we've just developed is a fisherman's observing ocean, observe, ocean observing network. So the commercial vessels are deploying all sorts of gear for us, collecting data, and the, no, the NOAA Sable Fish Surveys are also facilitating that data collection as well. So industry has provided financial support, logistical support. We have now branched into the Bering Sea with the Central Bering Sea Fishermen's Association working on the killer whale depredation issue, and we'll be working in Prince William Sound as well next year, next spring on the killer whale issue. So our goal is to improve measurements of the click creek rates to get this metric for NOAA and, and really um, get a good handle on testing these deterrents. So these are all the people that, all the organizations that we've collaborated with.
probably left somebody out. And there's more information. The cswap.info website is a little outdated, but NPRB has a documentary, and also NPRB, North Pacific Research Board, has been, been a big funder, and all of our reports are on that um, website. And also, we've also, which I didn't mention, we've been funded by National Geographic. They help fund the underwater video um, component, and also the joint uh, industry project, GIP, it's the oil industry co um, consortium, and they've also funded us as other collaboration, uh, collaborators. And I think that's it for me. Thanks, Jan. Our next speaker is Rick Edwards. He's an aquatic ecologist and lead scientist for the Gila Latini Experimental Forest here at the U.S. Forest Service Pacific Northwest Research Lab. Rick. Good evening. Thanks, Allison. Uh, let me know if I'm not speaking into this the way I'm supposed to. Okay, so it's been 20 or 30 years with uh, Social and economic events, humans are covering the globe, population is going through the roof. There's the rise of economies in China and India, um, increased use of natural resources, increased uh, oxidation of fossil fuels, uh, increased complexity, uh, increase in international trade and communication modes. So it's been 20 or 30 years since anybody thought that a single entity could deal with the level of the complexity of the interaction between human beings and the rest of the natural world. One of the, uh, the solutions to that is to reach out beyond whatever entity you're, you're organized or, or, or uh, situated within and reach out to other entities in space and time to try and combine and leverage resources so we can deal with these challenges at the level that they require. The Pacific Northwest Research Station, which is who I work for at the Juno Lab, uh, has recognized that the challenges, uh, the management challenges that they're uh, charged with have increased even as resources for federal research agencies have decreased. The, uh, the Pacific Northwest Research Station uh, has a territory that covers Oregon, Washington, and Alaska. About uh, 500 employees. We're located in 11 locations, four in Alaska, uh, Sitka, Juneau, uh, Fairbanks, and, and Anchorage. And in order to meet these challenges and increasing demands for management-related research, uh, the station has reorganized and undertaken some initiatives which uh, are important to those of us at the Juno Lab and I think relevant to the topic of the ACRC and why we're here tonight. The Juno Forestry Sciences Laboratory, which is where I work, which is currently in the old National Marine Fisheries uh, Building, is comprised of 16 research scientists. I think there's actually six uh, research scientists and then uh, support staff. We used to be about 35. Past 10, 12 years or so, because of budget decreases and person an overall decline in research in the Forest Service, uh, there's fewer of us now, and nobody thinks this is going to reverse anytime soon, regardless of who gets elected. So, the the question was, what are we going to do about it? Are we just going to close down the Juno Lab? The uh, research station has closed several labs around Oregon, Washington, Alaska, and uh, on an annual basis is tasked with the decision of whether to close another one to compensate for decreasing funding. And happily, they decided not to. Um, the research staff at the lab have been intimately involved in collaborative research as long as I, the 12 years I've been there, uh, with a number of projects, yellow cedar decline, carbon cycling, uh, 
uh, stream restoration effectiveness monitoring, some social work, uh, looking at community resilience. Uh, one, a big uh, part of our research program is uh, providing advice to the region in young growth timber management and so on and so forth. So we didn't want to give that up. We didn't want to shrink away to nothing. So a few years ago, the uh, station started three initiatives that all came together and uh, led to my being here tonight, which were very encouraging to those of us left at the lab uh, in terms of the, the near-term and long-term future of the Forestry Sciences Lab. The first of these initiatives was to be a signatory in the original MOU that created the ACRC. And that was some years in the making. And uh, this was a, an opportunity, we thought, at the lab to formalize these collaborative relationships and strengthen those partnerships and perhaps create some opportunities for even more leveraging of resources with other entities in the region. The second initiative was to commit to building a new laboratory space for us so that we could uh, move in for the first time into a building that had laboratories that were made to our specifications. And if you get a chance on a nice day when it isn't raining or snowing, wander three or 400 meters down the path in that direction and you'll see uh, our beautiful new laboratory building, which we're hoping to move into sometime in March or April. The third initiative, and the, the reason Allison asked me here tonight, was the establishment of the Hink Satini Experimental Forest out at the end of the road. The experimental forest system network in the, the Forest Service is a network of over 80 experimental forests and ranges spread mostly around the lower 48, but also with stations in Hawaii and the uh, Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. We have three or four in Alaska, depending on how you, uh, how you enumerate them. Experimental forests were created about 100 years ago for the first one. And they were designed to promote research and education. And each of those uh, has two components. For research, experimental forests have hosted an enormous amount of fundamental research that's taught us a lot of what we know about watershed hydrology, for example, or the acid rain problem. A lot of the research is also applied research, which is designed to provide information to support management of uh, watersheds and timberlands. Second. But no less important function of uh, experimental forests is an educational component. They're designed to work as areas where we demonstrate best practices or teach, either K through 12 or, or uh, college or graduate courses. When I was at University of Georgia, three of the courses that I took as a graduate student hosted field trips at Kuwaita Hydrologic Laboratory up in the mountains of North Carolina. So they're very important, both those aspects. In 2009, we dedicated uh, the newest experimental forest and only one of two that have been designated in the last 40 years in the Forest Service system, and that was the Hinksatini Experimental Forest out near Echo Cove. The name Hinksatini was gifted to us from a group of elders from the Wushkitan and Aquan, and literally translated means river watcher, which we thought was appropriate for a uh, land use designation that was designed to promote an increase in the understanding of how these uh, rainforest ecosystems work. That is the watcher there, which was designed uh, under commission by uh, local Clinket artist Nick Vonda. So it's always good to know where you are in space and time and organizational structures. You've seen this picture before. This dark green is the perhumid uh, coastal temperate rainforest, and of course we're located up here in the northern end of one of the most intact and largest temperate rainforests left in the world. If we zoom in a little bit, this is the Burners Bay area, and this colored polygon down here is the boundaries of the two sections, the main section and then what we call Unit B, which is down in there, of the Hinchatini Experimental Forest. We had uh, several options for where we picked a location for this new experimental forest. And we picked this one for a number of reasons. One, it was on the Juno Road system. It was close to an airport. So the colleagues from other universities, agencies from down south would had ready access. And it was low, uh, close to the University of Alaska, to our lab facilities. 
and other agencies with whom we could partner to do research out there. It was also immediately adjacent and forms a subcatchment of Berners Bay, which is one of the crown jewels of the Juneau area and an area of enormous biological and ecological complexity and interest. At the time we were looking for a location for the new experimental forest, it was clear to us that one of the, the big opportunities in bringing new knowledge about how temperate rainforests work was to focus on the relationship between the runoff, the enormous runoff of water and materials and transport and their influence on the adjacent estuaries and marine system. Uh, Alaska has something like 40% of all the coastline in the United States and a little over half of that is in Southeast Alaska. Most of the Tongass National Forest is surrounded by the ocean, which makes us very unique and creates a lot of opportunities. This is a close-up map of the forest. Again, this is uh, Echo Cove there and uh, Echo Ranch Bible Camp. The forest boundaries are outlined here, and then they stop right here, and there's uh, various other ownerships on the rest of the watershed going out into the bay. It's good to know where you are in organizational networks. Although we're one of the new guys on the block, we were successful in arguing that the reorganization of the experimental forest system, which is emphasizing key locations or nodes that will be part of a real-time uh, networked data system designed to, again, leverage the location of all these experimental forests across the biomes of the United States and generate data that will allow us to look at processes occurring at continental and uh, uh, global scales. And we are one of the nodes in that network. So we feel pretty good about that. I'll talk a little bit later about how we prove that we can pull this off. There are other networks and we're parts of some of those. Uh, if you look behind the, uh, the armory a joint use facility, there's a uh, precipitation monitoring station that we've been running in conjunction with uh, Aaron Hood here at UAS for going on about eight years now, which is part of a national network to monitor the composition and amount of precipitation across North America. There are a number of other networks that are either uh, well established or in the process of being established, and we hope to partner up and become a node in many of these other networks. Again, weaving this web of network upon network so that each network informs and amplifies the information coming from the other network. On the smaller scale, we have our own little experimental forest. Well, not so little. It's about uh, 25,000 acres and makes it one of the largest of the experimental forests. People ask me what we're going to do out there. They ask me what we're doing, and the answer is nothing right now. We're just getting started. But what we do out there will really depend on who we can attract as partners and what their interests are, provided it's compatible with improving our understanding of the function of coastal temperate rainforests. We, of course, have a series of uh, research themes that we think are very interesting and, and that the location lends itself to, and those are they, but if you have an idea uh, for research that's compelling that we could host in the experimental forest, then don't feel as though you're being excluded just because it's not on the, uh, the list of themes. This is a closer map of the experimental forest boundaries. And I just wanted to use this as a segue into what we see as the major unique opportunity in Hinkstatini that no other watershed, experimental watershed in the network of over 80 watersheds has. And that is the fact that within a compact area of uh, 10 or 12 kilometers, we incorporate the entire hydrologic cycle from glaciers through heavily forested valleys and floodplain uh, prime salmon habitat out into the marine system in the estuary. There's only one other uh, experimental forest in the network, and that's in Hawaii, that goes from ridge to reef, and they don't have glaciers, although they do have volcanoes, I think. Um, here we'll start at the top. This is the, uh, the Kauai Creek Glacier. 
comprises somewhere, I think, 9 or 10% of, of the drainage. Um, Snowfield, accretion zone, alpine ridges, perennial snowfields down through precipitous uh, valley walls and then down out into the valley bottom with the usual mix of uh, peatlands and muskegs and riparian forest. And then out through the estuary into the uh, southern end of Burners Bay. Within that one watershed, we encompass an enormous variety of the uh, selection of the variety of ecotones and, and sub-ecosystems in southeast Alaska. So it's a huge opportunity. We have an opportunity to see what's going to happen as the glaciers disappear in our watersheds right there 20 miles from Juneau. The other uh, Im important component, and I will say the one that got off to a, a faster start than research, is education. And because of the uh, uh, strong interactions we have with the native community in getting the name of the experimental forest. That led to an interest uh, among various uh, entities of the native community in using the experimental forest as a place they could do research and a place where they could teach native students in natural resource management. So we've had a number of interactions, hosting classes, using the experimental forest as a natural outdoor laboratory. And this is something we, uh, that we see can only grow. There's more and more interest in this. Uh, we're also interested in bringing in non-native school groups. And there are people in the lab working with people here at UAS, developing curricula uh, and so forth. My uh, semi-delusional long-term goal is to put a rainforest interpretive center in what we call Unit B, which is a 300-acre discontinuous parcel in the experimental forest that actually straddles where the paved road crosses Cowie Creek. We'd love to put in an interpretive uh, uh, nature walk and a little learning center there so we could host groups coming in. And then finally, we, have, we also have interest from other campuses, uh, UAF, in bringing forestry students down to Hinkatini for summer field camps so they can learn silvicultural techniques and, uh, for the students in Fairbanks so they can come down and see some actual trees. We recently finished up uh, a really fun uh, interaction with the Central Council of the Tlingit and uh, Haida Indian Tribes of Alaska as part of a children's forest program sponsored uh, and funded by the Tongass, the National Forest, which we termed the Hinsatini Outdoor Classroom, where we took high school students, pulled them out of class, which they really liked, and took them out and trained them in fundamental um, rainforest ecology, gave them uh, some experience in methodology and sampling water and soils and so forth um, to try and get them excited in a scientific approach to learning about their native lands. And the really fun thing for me about this was we had two native uh, knowledge bearers who were part, an integral part of our training, and Dave Katzik and I would use the same PowerPoint to give both a Western scientific point of view and the Clinket science point of view and uh, interact back and forth and learn from each other. And it was a really exciting and, and wonderful program. We're continuing that. We're bringing in additional people. We've got Dan Monteith from UAS and some other scientists from the lab. We, again, we think this can only grow. But our day job is as research scientists. We don't get paid to teach. And our enabling legislation does not allow us to teach. So we do this because we're motivated to do it and we enjoy it. But we need to partner up with other organizations, such as the ACRC and the University of Alaska, with professional educators who can allow us to do what we do best while also making it more effective as a way to transfer knowledge to, to students. And there's a thirst out there for this. The, the Glacier Visitor Center is a wonderful facility, and it's a good place to go and learn about glaciers, but there is no one place in Juneau where we can learn uh, the, the incredible things that we've learned about how rainforests function and where they might be going in the, in the next 50, 100 years. So we hope to be part of that. It would be fun to incorporate that into the educational program of the uh, experimental forest. All right, so I'll finish up. Um, 
We're just starting out. There's a, experimental force been around 100 years. Most of these experimental force started slowly and they built and it took them 20 or 30 years to get the programs that they have now. Uh, we're, f what, four years old now and uh, trying to get started in, in the worst era of, of research funding that anybody can remember in the last 20 years. So uh, we've got to uh, target our resources cleverly and carefully. So. Uh, what do we do in terms of uh, forest management? Well, the first thing we, we're doing is working with the Central Council and UAS to generate or create a operating and management plan where they're brought in specifically as co-managers of the property so that they can go out and get funding to come in and bring funding to help us to, to develop the experimental forest and our research program there. Allison made reference earlier to writing a, a National Science Foundation infrastructure proposal. And this uh, development of an explicit co-management uh, uh, model should help us attract other funding so that we can all have uh, better facilities out there to support research. We're also trying to create some infrastructure. What do people need to work in experimental forests? Well, they need access, and access is a problem out there because right now it's uh, walking across a trackless wilderness inhabited by brown bears and, and intractable muskegs and wetlands. Um, we need some facilities, uh, modest though they might be, so that we can send graduate students up there and have some confidence that they'll actually survive to come home uh, in, a, in a day or two and bring that uh, important data that they generate. Then we also want to uh, create an infrastructure that can provide baseline information. When researchers go into an area, they need maps, they need uh, baseline data, they need literature to help inform the generation of hypotheses. To that end, uh, we're working on a number of different things. We've got a contract to run LIDAR to generate a high resolution uh, um, topographic map and, and stand uh, structure map. We've been waiting for a year and a half to run LIDAR. And we finally got the company up from Corvallis about three weeks ago when it looked like we had enough clear weather uh, to run the LIDAR. They got half of it run before the clouds drove them back to Corvallis. Um, that has inspired me to be working with people up at University of Alaska Fairbanks on the deployment of these what are called UAVs or UASs, these unmanned or unpersoned aerial platforms that we can mount sensors like LIDAR units or uh, multi-spectral scanners or temperature scanners and so forth to help facilitate, again, create a, a non-physical structure that people can use to do research out there. I figure it's pretty important that we show the National Forest Network that we can be a responsible and reliable node in that uh, network I showed you of real-time data collection. So we have a prototype data station out on a ridge in the Davies Creek Valley that was selected because it has line of sight view from the glacier all the way out into Lynn Canal in the Estuarine system. It covers about 85% of Davies Creek value from line of sight, which should facilitate the deployment of satellite instrumentation stations that can then communicate with this central node with telecommunications. We're upgrading this station with uh, actual power generating capacity, uh, starting with photocells and a little radio shack. Uh, we're improving our communication so that we'll have real time internet access to the place. We'll put a couple cameras up there. Won't be as cool as watching um, sperm whales eat fish, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll call it Watcher Cam and we hope it, it'll still be popular. Um, and we hope that this will be the back backbone node that we can offer to researchers who might want to come in and put their own instrumentation installations out there and say, okay, you can do that. And then we'll allow you to beam your data back to the central station where you will have real-time access. And for those of us working in aquatics, particularly in the, in the coastal temperate rainforest, you know that a lot of the things you want to measure are event-based. Right? A lot of things happen in nature during storms, during floods. So it's really good to know when there's a flood out there so you don't have to drive 30 miles and hike three miles through the woods to see if it's time to take a sample or not. So these are the kinds of things we're doing. 
By March, we'll be located just a few hundred meters down the, the walkway, which we think will do uh, everything to improve the interactions with faculty here on campus and get students involved in the lab. We're developing infrastructure and a co-management structure so that we can partner together to use the experimental forest uh, as a research site. Think back to that map where we, you saw the Hinchatini is on the lower end of Berners Bay, and I believe Anne is gonna talk about the EPSCOR project, which is a really exciting possibility for us or, uh, for collaboration because the EPSCOR project in Southeast Alaska is using Berners Bay as its case study research area. So we're hoping we can offer uh, Hinchatini as a ground truthing and intense data generation location to inform some of the modeling approaches that will be used in the greater Burners Bay area and uh, maybe help make the EPSCOR project more of a success and get us off to a really good start with the experimental forest. Rick, that was great. Our next speaker, and our, our last but not least, is Dr. Anne Boudreau. She's an assistant professor at the UAF School of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences, and she's going to be talking about a, a new collaborative research program in Berners Bay. All right, so um, I'm going to be talking about a uh, new NSF-funded initiative um, that involves a whole lot of collaborators. Um, and the, the theme is how Alaska is going to adapt to a changing environment, which is a really broad theme. And I'll try and start broad and narrow it down to our uh, study area of Burners Bay here in southeast Alaska. Rick did a really nice job of painting that picture of ice field to estuary. And that's the theme that we're taking in our southeast Alaska test case. Um, the people listed on this slide are, are part, part of the research core team for the Southeast Alaska component of the project. And I wanted to um, uh, particularly acknowledge Sanjay Piari, who um, is the project lead and he's one of the principal investigators for this overall study. Um, and I, I'd also like to say that um, the information I'm going to be presenting in this talk is, is really, really belongs to a lot of people. And I'm a very small component of this. And so I'm honored to be able to present um, what is, is really the brainchild of a lot of different groups and individuals. So the, the impetus behind this proposal to NSF is that there are major envi environmental changes that are affecting Alaska's uh, water systems and landscapes. And we've seen some very vivid, vivid images that depict some of these changes. So um, there's been melting permafrost. It's led to things like these large sinkholes in the northern part of the state. Uh, we've seen um, melting sea ice, which has changed distributions of marine mammals and has affected subsistence hunting. Uh, there's been widespread coastal erosion, which has had uh, large impacts on coastal communities. And one of the changes that's particularly relevant to our area in Southeast is that there have been um, large changes in glaciers. So we've seen volume loss in glaciers, and we expect to see more um, melting and receding of glaciers over time. And so this um, overall project is, is asking, what is the capacity of the ecological and human communities to adapt to these large scale changes? And the, uh, the overall project is run, um, is led by researchers at the University of Alaska Southeast, Fairbanks, and Anchorage. And it's broken down into three um, case studies or test cases where we're going to be asking more specific questions related to adapt adaptive capacity of these systems. So um, UAF is, is leading a test case in the northern part of Alaska, UAA on the Kenai, and then UAS um, down in Southeast. I wanted to um, briefly mention what EBSCOR is. Um, it's an NSF-funded program. Uh, it's the experimental program to stimulate competitive research. 
and its mission is to strengthen research and education in science and engineering throughout the U.S. and to avoid undue concentration of, re of such research and education. So basically what that means is that NSF wants to support research capacity building at universities and states that have been underrepresented in NSF funding. So Alaska is one of a, a number of uh, states um, that is eligible for this type of funding. And because it's research capacity building, the funding um, typically uh, is for pilot studies. Um, it supports undergraduate and graduate research, but it, um, it's really meant to kind of initiate research and collaborations that will then lead to sort of longer term studies and hopefully more, um, you know, allowing universities to have more of a competitive edge in getting funding for continued research. So we have a, a large research team in this Southeast Alaska test case. The research core, the people that I mentioned before, and this is a group of physical, biological, and social scientists. Um, there is a much larger group of research faculty at all three universities. And then um, this is really critical to this effort um, that, the, uh, that we have external partners, including the Alaska Coastal Rainforest Center. And um, this is where that longevity comes in. So the seed money will initiate research, but there won't be any longevity in these um, initiatives unless we partner with agencies um, and community organizations. And I expect actually that this, this group will, will grow over time. So in Southeast Alaska, we're asking um, how changes in the physical environment, in particular changes to glaciers, um, will translate into effects on ecosystem services and the human communities that rely on them. So this is a really busy schematic of the Gulf of Alaska ecosystem. And um, right here, you can kind of see this pathway that we're interested in. So how are changes in glaciers going to translate into changes in freshwater discharge um, and then productivity in estuaries and marine systems. When we can understand those physical and biological changes, um, we can then start to ask questions about how, are they, how will those changes translate into effects on human communities. So our opportunities for fishing, um, subsistence, and tourism. And so we've broken our, our more specific questions into these three categories of uh, what are the, um, can we characterize the changing environment? Um, and if so, can we start to understand what the societal consequences of those changes will be? And finally, um, can we understand what the adaptive capacity is of the human communities to these changes? Um, and if we, if we better understand the changing environment and societal consequences, can we help develop, develop plans for adaptation um, as we anticipate these changes to come? So our, our study area is broadly southeast Alaska, um, but more specifically, we're focusing on the Burners Bay watershed shown here. And then we've sort of drawn this boundary, the social ecological boundary, um, which is sort of a loose boundary, but it basically includes the major communities uh, surrounding the Burners Bay watershed. This is an, an image of Burners Bay, and um, it's really a, a perfect system to look at this ice field to estuary complex because it's a, a glacially influenced system. Um, it's a very large watershed and it's a really special place. And I've actually, I'm relatively new to the area still, so I haven't experienced the Yulikon run in Burners, but I've heard it's just an incredible sight. And every spring, uh, Yulikon, which are a high energy forage fish, um, come into the bay to spawn and they're food for a whole number of different predators. Uh, I thought Mary Wilson described this really well, um, saying that when the Yulikon are in the bay staging for their spawning migration up the rivers, there might be dozens upon dozens of sea lions foraging cooperati cooperatively and rafting up to rest from their exertions. Harbor seals would be there too in quantity, and humpback whales would be likely to cruise through. Orcas may arrive in search of unwary sea lions or seals. So there's a, actually a whole feeding frenzy created by these Yulikon during their spawning period. So Burners Bay is a highly productive region too, and yet there's still a lot that we don't know, both about the physical and biological systems. So um, this is one of the, the specific questions that we're addressing. It's still very broad, um, and it's asking how changing climate glacier dynamics will affect features of the environment, including freshwater discharge, forests, as Rick talked about, um, 
salmon estuaries and plankton. And I'm going to focus on the physical drivers of the system and then some of the biological communities. So we, we can think about changes in glaciers in um, sort of in two ways. First, uh, glacial volume loss and consequent land cover change, and changes in glacial runoff. So um, we've been um, tracking res res glacial recession, and that is translated into increased glacial runoff, at least in the short term. But as glaciers continue to melt, over the longer term, we might start to see less of a glacial input into the system. And I just wanted to acknowledge um, Aaron Hood, who um, provided the next few slides, and he and his colleagues have done a great deal of research on glaciers in this region. So how important is glacial runoff to the freshwater discharge in the Gulf of Alaska? Um, well, first, we can, we can start by looking at the total freshwater discharge from different watersheds. So the Yukon um, is five times larger than the, the southeast Alaska watershed. Um, it discharges 215 cubic kilometers per year. Southeast Alaska actually discharges more, 370 square, uh, cubic kilometers. And then if we compare that to the Mississippi watershed, which is 20 times larger, it only produces less than 100 cubic kilometers more per year. So we're really outputting an enormous amount of fresh water into the system. And um, actually about a year and a half ago, Rick and um, his colleague Dave DeMore gave a talk at UAF, and they talked about this, and this, this really wowed me. It really stuck with me because I felt like this is a very unique system, and it affords the opportunity for research that you really can't do anywhere else in the world. And of the 370 cubic kilometers per year, about 30% is coming from the glaciers. So glaciers are an important physical driver to this system. And we can think about different components of those glaciers as having an impact on um, the, the physical system and the biological system downstream. So there's land to ocean fluxes of fresh water and nutrients that are coming off those glaciers. And then the glacial water itself has physical characteristics, so it's cold, it's fresh, it's very turbid, and it has impacts on ocean and estuarine circulation. So um, this is from a study by um, Hood and Berner, and they looked at um, watersheds throughout the, the Juneau region that had varying degrees of, um, of glacial coverage. And so you can see that as you increase glacial coverage, your stream temperature declines. So you have that really cold glacial water. And your turbidity, so this is a measure of water clarity, and as you go up this scale, the water becomes less clear. And so you have um, very turbid waters in the glacial systems. And that's something that you can visibly see when you go out into Burners Bay, where that glacial water stops and then the marine water start. There are also um, really distinctive biogeochemical signatures in the glacial water. And this is showing dissolved organic carbon across a gradient of percent glacial coverage. So the, the dissolved organic carbon is actually uh, decreases with glacial coverage. But what um, Hood and colleagues have found is that that carbon is actually very bioavailable to microorganisms. So they're able to um, consume the carbon readily in both the freshwater and the marine environment. And this could potentially lead to increased productivity due to glacial runoff. There's an increase in phosphorus with uh, increasing glacial cover. And phosphorus is um, often one of the limiting nutrients for primary productivity. So again, we might see glaciers as um, sources of nutrients to estuaries. As I mentioned, glaciers are changing, and this is showing some of the recent changes and the um, predicted changes over in the next um, near term. And so um, the, pr the glacial area is declining, and at the same time, the uh, discharge is increasing. But notice that there's a lot of variability around this. So the, one of the questions is how much variability is there in this physical system? And can we tease apart that variability that's happening on a seasonal or interannual time scale from much longer term trends? So um, next, we're interested in how these, this physical system is affecting the biology. And we have a rich ecosystem um, that's 
spans from freshwater to marine communities. And as I mentioned before, the, the glacial water um, can have clear physical effects on the biology of the organisms. So this water is cold, it's murky, <laughs> there's a lot of glacial silt, and so this could affect both the physiology and the foraging behavior of organisms in it. And we can break this up into sort of the components that might be most important to organisms. So temperature, salinity, turbidity, and nutrients. This is work that was done by um, folks at USGS. Uh, Mayumi Aramitsu provided this figure. And uh, what they found is that in Glacier Bay, there are hot spots of productivity that are in proximity to glaciers. And so um, zooplankton and then also a number of forage species like capelin and lanternfish are at much higher abundances right next to glaciers than they are in the central part of, of Glacier Bay. We might anticipate uh, changes in growth of fishes too. Um, so this is showing uh, kind of a generic relationship between fish growth and temperature where their growth increases with temperature kind of to a point where it's too warm and that's, that's a lethal level. And um, one of the questions we could ask is how this cold glacial water that's getting moved out into the, into the fresh water and the estuarine systems is affecting growth of things like salmon. Um, and, and asking how this translates into productivity of salmon populations, for example. We could also think about possible effects on behavior of organisms. So again, thinking about salmon as an example, they're feeding in streams, um, and if these are glacial streams and there's a lot of uh, turbidity in the water, um, and there's, uh, there have been studies that have shown that with increased sediment concentration, um, the reaction time of a fish is slower. So it takes them longer to detect prey or potential prey in front of them. Um, and this, again, could have effects on growth and productivity. At the same time, we know that you know, these, these important nutrients are getting moved out into the system. And so one of the questions is, what is the mechanism by which that carbon is, is coming out of the glacier, moving up into the lower trophic levels of the food web, and then up through the food chain? Um, and uh, Miyumi Aramitsu is a, is, works at USGS, and she's a, a PhD student at University of Alaska Fairbanks. And her dissertation is actually going to examine this question of how the glacial carbon is moving up through pelagic food webs from the primary producers to zooplankton, forage fishes, and seabirds. And um, she's actually using a carbon dating technique to detect glacial carbon. Glacial carbon is much older, um, so that so you, if you carbon date it, you can tell the exact source of that carbon. And then this is um, a, a study or a set of studies that I'm um, starting to design, and I'm interested in the linkages between freshwater and marine food webs. So not o only is um, this dissolved organic carbon getting moved out of the glacial systems, but all of that water is bringing along with it um, terrestrial and aquatic organic matter in the form of insects and other drift. And this could provide food for organisms in estuaries. Um, some of these for example, are things like starry flounder that we know are somewhat freshwater tolerant. Um, so one of the questions is, to what extent are they using these resources that are coming out of freshwater systems, and what does that mean for both the productivity of that system and the overall structure of this food web? So, um, I think that you know, one of the, the main challenges that we have to tackle is understanding the natural var variability of these systems. So we know that both the physical environment and the biological systems are highly variable in time and space. And um, even just sort of getting a baseline on that will be a pretty large effort. Um, but the idea is that we sort of create the groundwork for hopefully longer term studies that will look at these changes over time. And on top of this, and I'm not spending a lot of time talking about this, um, but there are people in this room who are an integral part of this, of this um, kind of linkage with the social environment and understanding how these changes in the physical system will then translate into changes in our ecosystem services, the things that we need from the Burners Bay and the Southeast Alaska watersheds, um, water, fish, uh, forest lands. 
And so our next steps um, for this study are to uh, finalize our research implementation plan. And a big part of this is identifying key data gaps. Um, what's really important also is, is knowing what's out there already. So um, doing an inventory of what data exists in terms of hydrological, geophysical, biological, and socioeconomic information. And then um, trying to build our efforts on what's been done already. And then um, coming up this spring is um, a new ocean sensor array in Berners Bay. So we're going to be putting out sensors that uh, track some of these physical variables like temperature, salinity, turbidity, and um, productivity variables. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. That was great. So um, I think we can take questions. We've got a few minutes left. Um, we are being recorded. So if you have questions, um, Katie will bring a microphone to you. So Rick, if you wouldn't mind coming up here. And I know I don't see Jan anymore. Um, but uh, if you have any questions for any of us, we'd be happy. There she is. Jan's still here. Um, we'd be happy to take, take questions from the audience. They're figuring out the microphone. All right. I think we've got a couple questions already. Okay. Uh, this question will be for Jan. Uh, whales are pretty smart. And uh, you're coming up with strategies to keep the whales from taking taking the black cod off the la off the uh, the long lines. Have you ha had any indication at all that the the whales are maybe learning these strategies and formulating counter strategies to your strategies? <laughs> In a sense, yes, although we haven't fully um, tested all the deterrents yet. So they, uh, we did have a decoy buoy out with a, with an engine cycling playback, and the whale came and interrogated the hydrophone. And so it's like, it's like Star Wars on the, the, on the son sonogram. So, so the, they, I think you're probably getting at the question that are they going to figure things out and just, yeah, they will. I think what's, what, they will. It's, but I think what's going to have to happen is that the fishermen are, uh, will just have to have a big toolbox with a lot of different options and just keep rotating them through and just trying to come up with new ones and um, or just live with it or or in this or just change the fishing strategy in terms of perhaps some someday it may have to go to pots that ho has a whole nother set of challenges. So it's, um, we're working on it, and that's all I can say is that, you know, I had a fisherman call me yesterday, he's in Chatham, the whales have moved into Chatham, and he's got, a, he was at anchor, and the whale's out there patrolling, waiting for him to come out to make his second set, so. And he's going, what can I do, what can I do? And I said, well, you can do this, this, and this. He said, I don't want to do that, I just want to get my fish. I said, I said okay, you know, just, or, or just wait it out, or, I mean, so we can offer suggestions, but um, it's whether or not, um, it's just up to the fishermen whether they can accommodate those uh, options in their fishing. Anybody else have a question? You probably hear me without that. Well, we can't, we, actually, we kind of need it for the broadcast, so thank you for waiting. I hate prolong the meeting here by asking a question, but. Um, uh, the traditional method of deterrence was, of course, explosives. Um, and I'm curious, have you found, I know it's, of course, illegal, do you have observers on the boats, or do you know if that's still going on? If there are explosives being used on well, sperm Steel whales bombs, or? one pound charges of nitromon, there's a whole bunch of things that used to be used, particularly in, in, um, in the Cordova area. Right. I, I, <laughs> so the question is whether or not the explosives are being used in seal bombs. I don't know that personally, that for sperm whales in particular, that that's been used. Um, it, it may have, um, but I don't know that. I know fishermen have been using um, 
anything from crystals to their sounders to try to deter them. So, so, but I have not personally heard that seal bombs are being used for sperm whales. So. This is for Jan too. I was just curious if you were getting any more, uh, a lot of other cool videos other than the one you had there from. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cool, cool videos. Yeah, we, we actually got, had one ahead of that one where the whale did a drive-by. We didn't have it decoyed with the line snarl and that whale is kind of cool because the whale just kind of interrogates the, the um, camera housing because there's a lot of air in it. And that's what they echolocate on is air in the air, like um, the target strength of that camera housing must be huge. So, and that's why we decided to decoy it because we know they leave fish inside a line snarl. So that is, but since then we've, we've yet to put cameras on the long line again. We are developing a camera that can go at depth and then come up to the surface. And so it, it will be on the long, on a real haul. So that will, will hopefully next summer or next spring, will, we will have some footage on that. Um, aspect, but, but one of the cool things that we're going to be doing is working with uh, killer whales and really trying to understand how, and putting cameras on the, on the lines, and because with killer whales, they don't really know how they're removing the fish, if it's acoustic or visual yet. There's some ideas, but the proof is yet to be determined because we have some indication that perhaps they aren't using acoustics or echolocation, that they are using vision to remove fish off a long line. So we, we may have some cool killer whale video before sperm whales, so. Ken, I'm gonna follow up on, on the, with Ann and Rick together, kind of. Um, so in Burns Bay and also the Hain Latini, there can be a large number of researchers to really address the number of issues that are there. How have you begun to think about how you're gonna integrate the, the research data as it comes out from the number of researchers in order to make this collaborative project really come out as sort of more of a, comp a comprehensive summation of what, you know, as you move forward. I can try, yeah. This actually might be more of a question for Sanjay, but I can, I can take a stab at it. So, um, for one thing, the, the F-score um, project or the funding is really directed towards starting projects. It's not really meant to, you know, have a nice, comprehensive package and then tie it up with a bow but um, the idea is that it'll it you know will the research core will sort of direct the projects that there's synergy between them and hopefully with you know partnering with um, agencies we can make those longer than you know a couple of years um, and also part of the funding is going to go towards a data manager so I think that their role is going to be really critical in sort of compiling the information that the researchers produce. So John, for the experimental forest, um, I lose a little bit of sleep over this. So it won't be long if this thing is successful before we'll need a full-time data manager. The experimental forest network, the, the Forest Service is in intense discussions about this, how they're gonna support the archiving and, and access to data generated by this experimental forest network. Uh, in uh, many of the ones that were on that diagram are also LTER sites, the long-term ecological research sites of the NSF program. And uh, LTER program requires and supports uh, data managers at their sites. So. It's a huge issue. It's something we hope there are solutions uh, out there. And we also expect to partner with UAS and, and Sanjay to come up with some kind of mutually uh, supported local uh, solution to that problem. I'll add a comment to that. Ha having worked with a lot of collaborators on this Fermo project, the amount of work goes increases logarithmically with the number of collaborators. So just as a word of caution, it's, it's a huge task. Uh, this is actually a question for Jan. Um, I was wondering how prevalent has um, longline depredation been in Sitka by sperm whales in the past? And if there is no baseline data, how you know how the deterrence will affect the whale's foraging capabilities and survival? So your first question is, how, how long has sperm whale depredation been happening in the Gulf of Alaska? 
off Sitka in the yeah it's it's on it's recorded by observers in the Japanese fleet since the 1970s at least it's been happening globally worldwide since maybe the last century perhaps so it's not a new occurrence it's just has escalated because of the change in management and of the fishery so and your second question was how can we if we don't have any baseline data how do we know if the deterrent is working how do we know if the deterrent is going to affect foraging capabilities and overall survival of sperm whales? Oh, overall, uh, oh. so I think the the key here is is that what they're doing, taking fish off a long line, isn't normal foraging behavior. So I think what we want to do is get them back to their normal foraging behavior. So in terms of understanding what the mortality and the population structure of sperm whales in the North Pacific or in the Gulf of Alaska is right now. That is really not known. We don't really know how many sperm whales. We know how many sperm whales are in our study area, but in terms of the whole Gulf of Alaska, it's unknown. We don't even truly know the stock structure. There are males that are up here, and the genetics shows, this is what I couldn't, didn't go, have enough time to go into. The genetics shows they come from um, multiple populations, so they're not all from the same, say, breeding area, but, but sperm whales don't even have one unique breeding area for um, their population and so um, these males come up and then they go back and spend their time in the equatorial waters and they just kind of roam visiting different groups of females that live in the uh, equatorial zone so you can't think about sperm whale population structures in terms of geography it's it's more of um, it's a it's a you have to really wrap your brain around looking at this population and how sperm whales exist globally in a different way. And it may be just that they're acoustically connected. So there's a lot, I guess what I'm saying is there's a lot, there's much we don't know about sperm whale population in itself. But I think the bottom line is, is that what they're doing right now isn't a normal feeding behavior. So, and that's what we want to get away from. Right. Well, it's 8.30, and I know Jan's got a plane to catch, so I think we'll wrap up. Um, I'd like to thank Jan, Ann, and Rick for presenting tonight, and I'd like to thank you all for coming. So, thanks. Thank